Hey friends, welcome to the Illustration Master Class for Friday, and I'm glad you're all here. Today is a special episode. I'm excited about it because we're going to talk about something that's very near and dear to me, um, which is picture books. It's also something that so many illustrators um, are curious about and uh, want to learn more about. How do I get a book published? How do I get a picture book made? What's the process uh, that happens with all that? And I know it's um, it's a lot. And um, I wanted to try and break it down and simplify it for you today and just tell you about my own personal experience with it. Um, of course, everybody's is different, but I do think that the experience I had in terms of actually making the book was pretty standard, uh, pretty much the normal experience one would have with that process. Now, um, this is not going to be a show where I'm going to be able to give you amazing advice on finding an agent or selling your book. Um, I will mention those things and I'll talk about how it happened for me. But of course, that's a, a really um, important step in the process that, um, you know, we could spend eight to 12 hours just having a whole series of classes on something like that. And I don't consider myself an expert in that realm. I consider myself a lucky artist and writer who happened to write a book that got sold um, and find, I found an agent to do so and worked with a, a wonderful publisher, Scholastic. And everything just aligned and it worked out for me. And I know that doesn't happen for everybody quite like that, but I can share with you that experience on today's episode, okay? Let's say hi to some folks who are joining us today. Fabio's here, buongiorno, and Viola, and Annika, and Barbara, and Wade, and Steve, and Umicorn, and Namisha, and I see as well Gareth, nice to see you, and Lizette, and Creo. Hello, everybody, glad you are here. If you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Remember, folks, that I'm uh, going to be reading the chat over on be.net slash Adobe Live. Be.net slash Adobe Live. That means it's on uh, Behance. And if you're watching the show over on YouTube or Twitter, great. I'm glad that you are here, but I cannot see what you are writing if you are asking me things. Okay? Head on over to Behance if you want to ask me some questions. All right. I see Tim is here as well. What's up, Tim? Nice to see you. Um, okay, well, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, this is the inside title page of the book that I had published, Please Say Please, um, back in 2016. Uh, and I want to talk you through how this all happened. So many, many artists out there, illustrators, have ideas for picture books. And they say, what do I do with this? Uh, how do I get it out there in the world? Um, I had the same thing. I, I woke up one day with an idea for a book about manners that wasn't stodgy. I uh, had found that when I was with my kids, who at the time were very, very young, they were only um, about two and four years old uh, when I had this idea back in 2013. Um, I had this idea for a book that would just try and encourage kids to say, please. And um, I started rhyming some some ideas, some, some phrases about please. And um, slowly but surely, this idea formed of a girl whose manners are not so good. She asks for what she wants um, in a very uh, kind of rude and direct way. And this man shows up out of nowhere and just asks if she would please use the word please. And when she does, amazing things happen. She gets some pretty stellar, amazing things. She gets more than she expected. Um, so that was kind of the, the gist of it. Now, I, I had this idea and I decided to go ahead and make a book dummy. So what is a book dummy? A book dummy is a very rough version of your book. Um, however, it is it is written at the right length. It's got the right number of pages for a picture book, and that can be anywhere between usually 32 and 40 pages. Uh, 32 is more standard. Um, a publisher will not necessarily reject a book that's 40 pages or somewhere um, in that vicinity, but it is cheaper for them to print a book that is 32 pages long, so that's worth considering. Uh, so the 32 is kind of the standard. Um, and I, I wanted to write this story and try and stick with these formats that were already out there and were common, so as to not give myself any disadvantages. And so the book dummy, uh, being the rough version of the book, for me was extremely rough. The main thing was that the text of the book was more or less final, or rather, the draft that I wrote was a good one. It was a revised draft of my own writing where I felt confident that it told the story well from beginning to end, 
um, and re would require not much editing. And then for the illustrations, I um, drew really rough sketches. And I'll show you what those looked like, okay? So hang on, I'm just gonna jump back out to my other camera. And I'm gonna show you, this is the first book dummy that I created for Please Say Please. And it is literally just copy paper, um, stapled and then taped, taped around the edges. And um, to give you an idea of how rough it is, here is an example of a uh, illustration. Let me get to this one here. Where the girl in the book has just received a ton of basketballs and she wants to uh, play basketball. She asks for a ball and she gets a whole mess of them, hundreds and hundreds, and she's bouncing all around and having a great time. You can see that that is extremely rough, okay? It's really just like scribbling. And most of the book, in fact, every page except for two, is handled exactly like that, okay? That is how I did it. So nothing fancy. Here's a, a page of her flying on a kite. I'll try and get that in front of the camera. There you go. All right, she's got a big kite there and she's flying up in the air after she asked for a kite. Um, now, just for contrast, I want to show you what those illustrations look like in the book. So let's jump over to the basketball page. Here it is. So the basketball page, you can see, this is the finished art, is a far cry from the sketch. Um, however, that one simple, really rough, scribbly sketch was enough to give the editors um, over at Scholastic a good enough idea. Pardon me. <coughs> Still getting over a cold. If anybody was joining me earlier this week, they know that I've been having these little coughing fits. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so that was enough to get the idea across. And the main thing was that the rhymes were clear and the story was moving forward and everything made sense. The other illustration with the kite was right here. So you can see the difference there. Now, I will also mention that the composition of this sketch remained almost completely unchanged. Um, so even though the sketches were very, very rough, the placement of the figures and the objects and the backgrounds and so on, all these elements, were pretty well fixed in my mind and sketched in that way as I envisioned them for the final art. And that was an easy transition then for me to just move to the laborious stage of painting these all out in Photoshop. Um, and for those who are curious about these kinds of things, how long does it take to do X, Y, Z, to create a final illustration for the book, Usually it took me anywhere between six for a simpler page, six hours, all the way to maybe 22 hours for something much more complex. Um, you know, example would be in here, this, this pet store image took a long, long time to get done. Um, lots of thinking there and lots of playing around with um, values and stuff to make it all read clearly. That one took a long time, but you know, an, an example of a simpler one would be this, you know, this is not too terribly bad. Um, and something in the middle might be maybe this one, you know, or this one was pretty, pretty complex. Um, I snuck myself in the, in the book right here over in the right. Um, so anyway, uh, the dummy is the first step. I created the dummy because I wanted to have something that I could look at. And I went to the trouble of printing it out because I also wanted to hold it in my hands and flip through it and see how does it feel to, to go from page to page and feel the rhythm of the story along with the art and, and get a sense of like, is this a good read aloud story? I would read it out loud and, and see how it felt. Um, and when I, when I felt pretty good about it, I, I saved those really, really rough sketches into a PDF and I had it ready to go. And the next step for me was figuring out how to get it out there in the world. At the time, um, I did not have a, a picture book agent or an agent of any kind. So believe it or not, what I did was I actually just started to hunt on Twitter for picture book agents. And I stumbled on um, a lovely person, Lori Abkemeyer, who was a agent for uh, nonfiction adult books and some fiction adult books, but had just 
started taking on and representing picture book authors and illustrators. And I mean, literally, you know, it was it was within that year or so she had started to um, get in there. And my thinking was, um, because this was a new area for her, maybe I could approach her and say that I'm an experienced illustrator with a lot of editorial work and advertising work under my belt, but I've never done a picture book. And I just said to her, would you consider uh, taking a look at this one dummy I have? Now, the fact that I came to her with an offer to actually show her content, and I explained and pointed her to my portfolio to show that I had published work already, it just wasn't in this specific uh, field, or this, this area, right? Uh, this market, rather, excuse me. Was enough for me to get a, a, an email from her, and then we, we went from there and I, I showed her the please say please dummy and um, she said that she believed she could sell it. And so right then and there we decided to create uh, a contract and I, I signed on to be represented by her and she would represent me to sell the book to a publisher. And at this time um, I happened to have already met at an illustration conference uh, four years prior, a man named um, David Saylor, uh, who was a creative director at Scholastic, and David uh, and I had a nice conversation about things not having much to do with picture books, really, to be honest. I've, I've actually given this, this talk to students at universities before where I mentioned the many times in my life where meeting somebody in our industry um, and then connecting with them on some topic that has nothing to do with really the business is is usually a better way to make a connection than to try and just force yourself on them with your work. Look at my work, look at my work. And here's, you know, um, if you can make a more personal connection with somebody, I always find that to be uh, a valuable thing. And I, we, we, we talked about uh, books we like and, and comics we like and other things and travel and whatnot. Um, and a few years after that, I went ahead and I, I, had, I had pitched him an idea for a graphic novel and got to have a meeting with him in person. It did not work out, but that meeting in person also further solidified just that connection and that relationship. And he's a great guy and I kept in touch with him and just wrote a few emails now and then just to say hello. So I suggested to Lori that maybe we could reach out to Scholastic and see if they might be interested um, in a book like this for ages three to six in that area um, and we gave it a shot um, and we had we pitched it to a couple of other places but Scholastic went ahead and said yes we, we can we can make this happen now like I said at the beginning of the show everybody's experience is very different um, I was coming into this as an experienced illustrator who had already worked for certain clients that I think by my having worked for them it certainly didn't hurt in my getting Lori to agree to at least entertain the notion of, you know, that I was interested in such a thing or to look at my, my dummy. Um, but this is not to say that if you have a really good dummy and a really good book idea, you couldn't just approach an agent the way I did and say, I have this, this dummy. I've looked at what the work that you've represented in the past, the people you've represented in the past. I think this is a good fit. And I would really appreciate it if you would just take 10 minutes to just read through it and tell me what you think. Um, you know, I think that this kind of direct approach can really work. It worked for me. I know it has worked for others. And if it doesn't work, the key is to just keep trying. Um, and especially if somebody gives you really good constructive feedback, if they take the time to do that and they have experience in the business, um, try as best you can to really take that in, digest it, think about it for a few days, and then look again with fresh eyes at your work with those person's comments in mind and see if there's something there that, that you think, yeah, I agree with that comment. Um, if, you, if you get the comments back and there's some negative comments or some things they wanna change or suggest that you change and that's why they're passing on your work, it's not a good idea to look at those comments, digest those comments, and then within 10 minutes have a reaction to them. Because most times, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have an emotional response 
that emotional response will be, this person doesn't like my work. How dare they? Don't they see what a genius I am? Well, I can't work with them. My book is fine the way it is. I'm not changing anything. If you wait a few days and let those ideas just sit for a minute and then come back to it, you will have calmed down and you can have a more objective look at it. This is not to say this person's comments are going to mean anything because it is really just one person's opinion, but it is important to remember that if that person giving that opinion has more experience in the publishing world than you do, it wouldn't hurt to take them seriously. I'm going to pause for a moment to ask some, uh, to answer some questions. I see some questions here. Um, are these all created in Photoshop? Yes, Namisha. Why not use Illustrator? Because these are not vector illustrations. I like to use more painterly kind of look, so I use raster uh, applications like Photoshop, and I use custom brushes to, to paint the images. To do so in Illustrator would be a very painstaking process and would not work. Illustrator is better for building images as shapes. Um, I always think Adobe Illustrator should have been called Adobe Shape Builder. That's my opinion. Um, for a book typically done in is a book typically done in Photoshop? No, they could be done in any app. You could absolutely do it in Fresco. Um, just keep in mind that the file size limits, such as you know, 8,000 pixels square would be as big as you could get. So that would be one limitation, but you could always create single page illustrations in Fresco and import them to Photoshop to create a spread. But anyway, um, let's see what else. Any other questions here? Let's see, InDesign is good for compiling the book at the end and preparing it for print. Sure, you could do that. It's not necessary. Um, I just sent individual pages to Scholastic as uh, TIFF files, and they put them all together on their end. They have art departments, you know, and art directors and creative directors who can do all this stuff. Um, alrighty, so anyway, uh, the next step is so after you get to where you have this this dummy right we talked about this um and the dummy is approved you get the book sold um you will be assigned to work with an editor an editor will go through and make changes or suggest changes um you do not have to say yes to everything an editor suggests you can have a dialogue about it and you can say here's why i think this is stronger or not stronger or whatever um and for me, for example, there are a few things that I, I, I didn't agree with. Um, but with it being my first book, I didn't want to be a difficult customer, difficult uh, collaborator. So for most part, any changes that were made, and there were very few, I'm happy to say, I was happy to pretty much roll with them. Um, then I was having to create the final art. So now everybody works on a deadline. So uh, the standard amount of time you're given to complete a book, I'm sure, is, is somewhere between um, you know, four to maybe six or eight months. I don't know. Uh, but that's kind of what I've heard. I was given, uh, four, four months to complete, um, the art. And that, that was for me, I think a total of, um, something like 15 illustrations, something, something like that. Maybe a 16, doesn't matter. Um, and so it wasn't, it was enough time to do it, but I did have to, you know, get my nose down and really work. And, um, you can see here that this art also includes things like the inside, uh, the copyright and dedication page. Okay. So you have to create something for that. If you don't, you can just have them be white pages. That's fine. But I wanted to create art for everything. And here's the first spread of the book. Now from the first spread on through. The very last page, they said we're, we're using this many pages, make sure that you know you work all that out with the, the editor and art director first. Um, but once you're in this final art stage, you know, you don't mess with that stuff. You make sure you stick with it. You don't want to try and create major changes to the book halfway through creating the final art. That's why those first stages are so important in creating a good dummy. The better and more finalized and more um, well edited your dummy is, uh, the easier the job is for the publisher. Now that's good. You don't want to present them with something so rough that, or so um, un unresolved, I suppose, that then they have to try and struggle to come up with a way to resolve it. Uh, so this is important. Try to create less work for this collaborator who is willing to publish your book, right? And the same goes for agents too. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, anyway, 
I, I do want to talk about this this format though and, and point you to some resources that are out there. So let's look at this one here. <coughs> so sorry. Um, this is this is a standard 40 page uh, template. Of course, you can just trim it down. And I found this online. I just I typed in 40 page children's book template. There's so much stuff out there. It's just a simple PDF. Um, paste down is just the inside, okay? um, like a hardback book, the piece of paper that's pasted to the, the, the board of the book on the inside, that's the paste down. Uh, the end papers are, if you look here at the copy I have of Please Say Please, uh, the end papers are right here. That's the inside of the book. And I created a tiling uh, pattern for that. Um, again, not necessary, but a nice thing to do. Um, the next page over from there is the back of the end papers. And then you have your title page. You can see there's all this stuff that has to happen up front. Then a copyright. And then here you have um, like a dedication or something else. All right. And now it's here it says text start. So that's that first spread of the book. Of course, there are exceptions in every in every case to these layouts, but this is pretty standard. Now, from there, you're working in spreads until you get to that very last bit. Okay, so that could be the last page of the book here on the left. Remember, if you're doing 32 pages, just keep in mind that on that 32nd page, um, you're going to be in a situation like this. Let me just jump over here to this. This is a lovely little template which I love, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. Another reason I love it in just a minute um, from Debbie Ridpath Ohi. Uh, you go to inkygirl.com, you can grab this template. She's really graciously offered this to everybody for free. Um, what I love about this, and this is a huge part of the process for, for me when I do dummies, and I know a lot of other people work this way as well, is that when you have a template where it's all on one page, two things happen. First, you are forced to work very small. So I'll show you, this is this is as big as it gets right here. So if I were gonna do a story about a character, um, I'll go ahead and grab a pen for this so it's, it's nice and crisp. If I were gonna do a story for a character uh, who maybe it's like a, a bear who finds a bicycle in the woods, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, okay, first spread. Bear is walking in the woods, okay? So I got a big tree here. That's some other trees behind him right there. Already, I'm thinking about the big picture. I'm thinking of the big elements. Here's my character, okay? And I say, there is my spread. I'm not gonna allow myself to get into any details here and get bogged down in details. I might deal with contrast here and there you know, and throw some ideas here for negative space or whatnot. Okay? Doesn't matter. But this is as detailed as I'm going to get in that spread. Okay? Then I just move on. I say, okay, next spread, what happens? You know, here's a bicycle he finds in the woods, just lying on its side. Okay, maybe it's up against a tree here. And here there's a bear reacting. Oh my gosh. What's that? Okay, bicycle, exciting, okay. That's it. Now, the benefit of working, Pierre, salut, ça va, j'espère que tu vas bien. Um, the reason this is so beneficial is I can quickly move through these pages, these spreads, and I can look, this is the second advantage, I can look at the whole story as one big, picture and feel how is it moving what's the pacing is it too slow here do i need to speed things up speed up the action slow things down have there be a beat here have there be a pause right um this is important but and also this thing about keeping it simple is going to help you to tell your story more quickly and get through this process before you need to get really busy with your sketching there's no reason to work on a larger format for rough sketches when you're trying to plan out a story um, when you're going to have to change things anyway, there's always going to be stuff you're going to change and you're going to edit and you're going to have to go back and figure out more, you know, how how some element of the story is going to be more more fluid. You might might change a setting, you might change, you know, character interactions, camera angles, whatever. 
working at this size really makes a huge difference. Okay, so he finds the bike, you know, then you could have, you know, get up close and have the bear asking, you know, what is that thing? I wonder if I should, maybe it's going to hurt me. I don't know if I want to touch it, you know. And then on this spread, you could have him getting down and, and sort of just poking at, at the bike, right? So he's just poking it. There we go. Then we go to the next spread. See what I mean? Look how simple this is. I know what this means because I'm the artist and I'm sketching it. Now, if you show this to somebody else, they might be like, what the heck is this? That's fine. It doesn't matter. This is your language. This is your vocabulary you're using to just get your story told for yourself to get an idea of how it's working out. And it's so good to have this all on one page. I highly recommend working this way for stage one. Uh, Michael has a question. Do they give you dimensions for the pictures or do you draw a certain size and then they reduce them? Um, for me, I drew about one and a half times the size of the printed page. So that's what I did. Um, but that doesn't mean it was necessary. That was just a personal decision I made. Um, I wish I could remember <laughs> what they asked for. Uh, but I can't. I, I think you could, as long as you're working 300 DPI, I maybe mean, 450 DPI to be extra safe, um, and you're working at the physical size, physical dimensions for that, you know, for that res, I assume you're fine. Um, so there you go. But you can, all those things you get worked out in the end, it's nothing to worry about. What matters first is getting the story down, getting a good dummy, pitching that dummy, and getting someone to pick up that dummy. Yeah, I like this story. I want to run with this. And then someone on the publisher's side will give you all those specs. You don't have to worry about it. Um, merci, Pierre. Mon français est nul maintenant, mais ça va. Um, I'm going to have to say please again, says Wade. <laughs> nice. Okay. So, yes, what are the two benefits? One, you tell your story quickly. You jot things down. It's your own vocab. You don't have this pressure of having a larger piece of paper to work the details in, correct? Second advantage is you see everything all on one page, the entire story from start to finish, and you can really get a sense of how it's flowing. Alrighty, so there you go. Okay, so check this out. It's at inkygirl.com, inky, I-N-K-Y, girl.com right here. And um, really, really wonderful to have. You can always make your own as well, but it's great to just just know this is here. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to move over to uh, <clears throat> Acrobat here. Um, so sometimes, not always, but sometimes I'll have an idea for a story. And this is a story that I, I pitched a few years ago. I'm actually going to revisit it and maybe, maybe try and find a home for it. But... Um, Sometimes I have an idea for a sort of a style that I see a book working in. And for this book, I had this idea of this more sort of abstract kind of style for the book. And I decided to go a step further than creating the rough sketches with pencil. And I actually used some brushes and did a kind of a, a treatment that's a little more, you know, it's like a color treatment like this. Okay. And I just wanted the, I wanted the agent and the editor to see what this book could look like. And so I went to that trouble, um, which brings up something I didn't mention earlier to you, but this is important. One of the things to do in the dummy to really sell it, and this worked for me, was although I had a um, insanely rough <laughs> approach to the whole thing, right? I included two finished illustrations in the dummy so that both the agent and the art director creative director at scholastic would have confidence in me being able to create that final art if you don't show them anything saying that you can do it you know showing that you can do it how are they to know that you're capable of doing it so i did one spread here And I did another spread further towards the end for the image I thought would be a, a good seller for this idea of a tiger. I repainted both of those for the final art um, because I just wanted to. Um, but those two images, just providing two, you don't have to do any more than that. Two is plenty. This will show 
a couple of things to them. One, if you have a character in the book who is going to appear over and over again, you're proving that you can draw them more than once, okay, and keep them on, on model for the character, right? Two, you're showing them the style is going to be consistent. The style that you're using for the artwork is going to be consistent. Um, and three, you're showing them that you have the illustration chops to illustrate a book and, uh, and not struggle with that. So, all right. So yeah, this sometimes, you know, I'll go to this kind of trouble. This is not a very common thing for me to do, but for this particular instance, it made sense. So I wanted to show you that this is also possible. It's not like there are really fixed rules about dummies. Okay. Um, alrighty. Now, <clears throat> Here's an example of a sketch for the cover. Now I did six, five or six different cover sketches. When it gets to this point, people want to see your sketches and they want you to come up with lots of ideas. And you just have to go for it and be rough and, and play around a lot. And again, you don't have to be very tight with these. This is as tight as I got for any of the cover sketches. This is the one that finally won out. And here's the final cover. And I'll zoom in so you can see a little bit sort of the, the brushwork. Um, this was done 100% with about four or five brushes from my gouache brush set, which all of you have access to, remember? You just come over to uh, this little drop-down menu in Photoshop brush panel, and you say get more brushes. And from there, download the gouache brushes if you want to try and experiment with a look like this, okay? the All the sort of texture and, and transitions you see here were done with those gouache brushes. Um, it was a good chance for me to practice some hand lettering as well. I was really glad that they let me letter the, the cover and not, not set it with type. I wanted to letter the, the word bubbles inside as well, but um, that was not allowed. Um, drawing and... An exercise to get through random compositions from Mark Simonetti. Drawing in tiny helps to take some distance and get powerful compositions. Yeah, yeah, for sure, Pierre. Zooming out makes a huge difference. Same with this process. Is the process for creating illustrations same for print and ebook? I did everything in uh, RGB, Nimisha. And I just, what I do, and this is a trick a lot of people do, is I'll show you. If I know something's going to be printed, I just create a standard RGB file. And when I go to select my colors, okay, I want to show you this. What I do is, oh, I'm sorry, folks, you didn't get to see the cover there, did you? Here you go. I think I had the wrong camera angle on there. So this is what I was talking about with the gouache brushes right here. And you come to this drop down menu right here in your brushes panel and say, get more brushes. And you can download those gouache brushes. All right, my mistake. All right, so what I do is I open an RGB file to answer that question about color. And every time I go to pick a color, okay, see this little warning sign that pops up right here in Photoshop for this blue, for example? What I know when I see that little warning sign is that it's a color that is not easy to print, okay? And so in order to make it print safe, all I do is tap on the little square next to it because what that's doing is suggesting for me a color that is the closest in hue, saturation, and value to the color I'm trying to choose, but it's going to be print safe. So there you go. Now I know that color's safe, so I can uh, print. I can draw with it. So if I go over here and I say I want to use this color, and I say, oh look, right? I can I can draw with it. It's going to look fine on the screen, but in print that's going to be a problem. And so what I'll do is tap on that little square right there. And that is the color that I can get closest to right there. You can see that they are different, but not too, not too different. That's Photoshop doing its best job to choose a color that's print safe for you. My advice is always to do this. Just stay within this kind of area in the color triangle. If you're, if you're used to using the square here, so if you go to the, the little hue cube like this, um, every time you get up to the top here and push it all the way to the right, you're gonna run into a lot of problems unless you're working with pure cyan, magenta, or yellow. Um, and so I always just kind of camp out around here, you know, in this vicinity. See how I am right here? This is all kind of safe right around here. You go into like the greens, you're always gonna run into some trouble. So just, you know, desaturate a little bit. See that? That's safe right there. 
there's even a trick you can do. There's a key command you can hit that'll keep your color gamut uh, safe. Um, and someone mentioned it to me one time and I forgot what it was, a combination of like command shift K or command shift Y something. And it just knocks out, grays out the colors that you can't use. It's really cool. It's a neat trick. So if anyone knows that trick, go ahead and post it in the chat, please. Um, Alrighty, so here's another example of a, of a dummy. Um, in this case, you know, I'm, I'm doing a bit more design with the face right there because I want to keep it so that you understand the facial expressions and whatnot, right? But no backgrounds, nothing fancy, just, you know, an idea of here's this guy, here's his son, okay? Now I want to show you what can happen with, with uh, pitching a book. This book never got made. I hope someday it finds a home. But um, when working with my agent and uh, one of the... Um, people, we got it in front of a publisher who was interested in it, um, but they wanted me to try a different art style. So this was the original style that I was sort of pitching. It's kind of a retro sort of look. Um, they didn't like it. So I went with something completely crazy retro. They didn't like that. So then I changed it to animals and that did not fly. So I changed it to different animals, still did not fly. And eventually we just gave up and said, all right, we'll move on and try something else. This can happen. It's funny because you can have a story idea that you think works, but depending on who you're working with, they might just not feel good about the art style. And you might have to try and change things up. Now I tried several times and I started to just get sort of frustrated. And I wondered if maybe the thing to do would be to just go to a different publisher. And that's what I hope to do someday with this one. Um, but in the meantime, I got involved with other projects. But I just want to forewarn you, this is the kind of thing that can happen. You can have a story you feel good about. And you can't lock in on an art style that really tells it the way your collaborating partners feel it should be told. Um, and this brings up an interesting point about, about collaboration and how there's always going to be compromise in, the, in this world of making picture books because, you know, the the people you're working with on the, on the uh, agency side and on the and on the, um, the, the publishing side, they're going to know a lot about what kinds of books sell. And of course, you know, bottom line is they need to make money. So you might have an idea where the style that you want to work in is maybe so dissimilar from what's out there that it's a little scary for a publisher to take a leap of faith and try that. So they want to maybe rein it in and make it a little more conservative or a little careful, closer to something that's already worked, been more successful. It's a balancing act. If you get too similar to stuff that's already out there, it gets lost in the shuffle. If you Go maybe too far in the other direction. Maybe nobody really can figure out how to get into it. Um, there are, of course, always exceptions to this where something very original comes out and really hits. Um, but you have to find the right kind of publishers. So remember that there are hundreds of publishers out there. There are um, hundreds and hundreds of agents. And finding someone who you work well with really makes a big difference. And that can make a big difference for you. Um, I, I had a good time with Please Say Please with working with my, my first agent. After a few more projects, just didn't feel like my what I wanted to do was working out um, or lining up with what she was planning to do on her end with representation. So she and I went different ways and I'm now uh, working with someone who I think is more closely aligned with the kinds of projects I want to do. Um, and his name is Chad Beckerman and he's over at the Cat Agency. Wonderful place. Um, and already I just feel this new energy with him. So this is also important as an artist. You have to, if you're feeling like you're bumping up against a wall with creative partners and you've tried to make it work. It's not necessarily that they are, you know, trying to thwart your creative uh, efforts or anything like that. It's just that you don't have the same ideas for what works and that's okay. So you go and try and find someone who, who does and that's a great thing. Um, did I have a style that I liked for this story, Wade? Um, honestly... I was kind of digging this one, but the, the original one I, I felt good about. I liked this. Um, yeah, I just thought it was pretty nice. I don't know, maybe because it reminded me of uh, books I read when I was a kid that were printed in the 60s and 70s, but I'm not really sure. Would I use Pantone colors? No, Stephen, I would not, no. Um, you'd have to find a publisher who'd be willing to do some special kind of printing for you and. Um, you know, of course, if you're a really famous picture book artist slash writer, you can do whatever you want. People will know that your books are going to sell. You're not a risk. 
<laughs> to, to bet on when it comes to these things. But if you're just getting started, as I was, you want to try and stick within the rules, make it cost you know effective for everybody involved. Um, publishers take a risk when they print 10,000 copies of a book. They want to sell those. So, you know. Um, all right. So you get through making the art, okay? You send it off. The editor and the art director say, great, we're happy. Uh, what happens next? Well, they're going to print the books and they're going to try to sell them. Now, depending on the size of the publisher and, and how well known you are as a creator, they might throw a lot of marketing dollars behind it and assign to you a publicist and get some, some banners made and some cardboard uh, cutouts, you know, to put in the bookstores and they'll, they'll make some noise about it and, and get you some press and this could happen. Or like me being a first time author illustrator back in 2016 for this kind of thing, I got a little bit of press, not much. And then I was on my own and had to figure out how do I get this book out there? There's a whole other stage here you have to go through, which is promotion. Um, and well, this can be as much or as little work as you want. If you want the book to sell, you know, you can rely on things like word of mouth and good reviews. And I had some good reviews and I had some good word of mouth, but that just isn't enough in the crowded publishing space that we live in. And I'm not a celebrity, so that didn't, my name didn't uh, offer any, you know, help there. Uh, so what did I do? What did I do? Uh, what I did was I created a website here um, for the book. And I created a trailer for the book. And I sent it to Scholastic and they used it on their website. And um, I'll show you the trailer. And I'm not sure if the sound will come through. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So we'll give it a try. If the sound doesn't come through, don't worry about it. I can tell you, but just somebody give me a thumbs up or say you can hear it if you don't mind in the chat. So I'll know either way, but I'll, I'll play this for you now. All right, it's not playing. So hang on a minute. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to go ahead and Let's see here. Reload this and see if I can open this in a new tab. No, I'm sorry, folks. I'm not sure why it's not working, although I, I suspect it might be a browser thing. Hang on just a minute. I'm going to hold this up for you. And I, I hope you'll bear with me because I do think this is an important thing to demonstrate, which is how to make a book trailer which you, believe it or not, you kind of have to do these days. Without a book trailer, you're kind of in trouble. Crazy to think that this is such a necessary thing. All right. So I don't think you'll be able to hear this, um, but I'll, I'll see. Let me see if I can, if I turn up the volume, maybe you'll hear some of it, okay? Breaking go. news! Children across our land have come down with bad cases of I wants. I wants. I want. I wants. I want. I wants. Do not despair, good citizens. The cure is here, and it's a book. Just read them, please. Say please. By Kyle T. Webster. This magical book is full of flying kites, pancakes, <laughs> pet tigers, and even giants. And when you finish reading, please say please. The I wants uh, will turn into. Please, 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 please. Read, please, say, please. Available wherever books are sold from Scholastic <laughs> Press. Well, there you go. Um, so hopefully you could hear some of that. 
And uh, Wade very kindly put some links in there for you. Um, so creating a trailer like that, I mean, if you're not a whiz at video editing, and I'm certainly not, I'm going to tell you that that took at least a week of work. Um, and it's just one of those things you have to say, all right, I'm going to be cool with this. I'm going to have to spend some extra time to promote the book. And I created a coloring sheet for kids. I went and did um, a bunch of other promotional materials for it. And it's just the thing you have to do to keep the book out there. Now, being a, at the time a full-time illustrator as well as an instructor at university um, and also managing my Photoshop brush business, it was very hard for me to stay on top of keeping the book fresh and alive and exciting for people. Um, and I probably could have spent more and more hours every week to keep that going. And I just couldn't make the time to do it. Um, but if you really believe in your book and you really want to get it out there, of course, you got to go for it. You've got to do a lot of promotion. You have to be relentless about it. Don't worry about being annoying about it. Just keep going. Um, and that's how you do it. Now, a huge thing that matters as well is visiting bookstores and reading the book. It's a shame that we are living through this horrible global pandemic because, of course, setting things up like that now is extremely difficult. So what do you do? Well, you do virtual visits. You figure out a way to virtually visit schools and um, talk about the process you went through because kids are fascinated by the process of how a picture book gets made. They, they read so many of them, but to actually meet an author, illustrator, and see how that happens is fascinating. Um, I was fortunate enough to go around and, and do that a lot. It also opened the doorway for me to do some, some great uh, service work for schools, um, getting the books donated to libraries and also getting uh, partnering with a wonderful organization here in my town called Bookmarks where we got a grant and had 500 copies of the books distributed to children um, at uh, Title I schools in the area who do not have uh, any books at home. And um, that was a really special moment to get to meet those kids and, and read the book and do some drawings for them, things like that. Um, so a lot that can come out of these kinds of projects. Um, and hopefully uh, what also happens is by getting a book actually published and printed and on the shelves, um, you then can have this opportunity to start making more books or to working on similar projects like that, working maybe as an, as an illustrator for other authors. Um, and if that is something that you're interested in, then definitely this is a great way to get in there and start doing that. So um, I'll pause again, see if we have any questions. Uh, color and how many copies you aim to print can also be a decision-making equation. You can go with RGB for brighter colors if your print run is small. Digital printers do great work now. Yeah, that's true, Steve. Um, yeah, it depends, I guess, on how many you're going to print. If you're aiming for a huge print run, go CMYK and web. Yeah, all my all my files were RGB and they were converted to CMYK um, for the final flat files that I sent. But converting them to CMYK didn't change anything in terms of appearance because of that trick I showed you earlier where I just always look for that little warning sign, so to speak. Um, that just helps me. Um, print on demand is another method. Yes, you can do that. Um, but you know, if you're going that route, you're going to be probably self-publishing and that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, you talk about needing to promote your book. Well, if you're self-publishing, you got to go promotion crazy because you don't have the assistance of that larger organism that, uh, you know, that, that engine in the publishing house to kind of help with distribution and with all the other good stuff that comes from it. Um, so that's also important. So let's look back on what we talked about. So step one, do you have a good story idea? You don't know you have a good story idea. You really don't until you make a dummy. And before you make a dummy, go ahead and look at this. Okay. Look at your whole book on one single page using a template like this read through it and feel what it feels like to read it out loud picture books are meant to be read out loud and that's always how they're consumed um so read it out loud look at the work be objective and compare it to what books you love the books that you loved as a kid and the books that your children love or the books that anyone you know who has kids loves look at the look at the books that are selling really well at the time take a look at the top 10 top 20 books in in um, the united states market right now or the market where you live right now and uh, go and check out these books and see what they're like. Um, then I get to give you a better idea of you know how to tell a story for certain age groups. Okay. 
Then when you've done this, you've, you've looked and seen what the story looks like from afar, okay, bird's eye view, and you're starting to feel good about that. Um, and don't forget the writing. I mean, I, I know we're talking about drawing here, but your manuscript really has to be and keep it. You have to keep it tight, okay? Um, picture books are not meant to have, you know, 300, 400 pages per uh, words per page. You understand? You are trying to keep them pretty tight. Um, but when you feel good about your manuscript, and you feel good about the way you've laid it out with a template like this, then you can move on to something like uh, this here, where I have a, a slightly larger set of dimensions here for myself to sketch in. And then I can say, okay, now, now I'm going to have, you know, more time to really figure out how this bear is designed. Okay. So here's my bear, right? And I can think, think about character design, right? That's a whole other thing. Make sure that, you know, you, you have a separate sheet of paper, separate file if you're working digitally, whatever, for how you're going to design your character, right? So I'm going to maybe have this bear as like kind of skinny. Big head, kind of skinny. That's just a hideous looking creature right there, folks. Hideous. Okay. But it doesn't matter. At this, when I get to this kind of size, I can really start to throw in more details and start to think about what's going on here. Okay. And you take each of these, you notice how I have this pink border on the outside. That's so I can do this. I can flatten the image, command A, command C, and copy it, paste it into something like this, right, at a slightly larger scale. And I can then lay it out again all on one page and look at it with slightly tighter sketches. And then that will eventually turn into my first dummy. Always bearing in mind, of course, that I need what? I need to leave room for text. Don't forget you need room for your text and make sure you work that into your design. Be thinking about that from day one, okay? That's important. Okay? Um, right, so that's the next thing. You, you go to this stage. Now, I was talking about character design a moment ago. Quickly want to take a look at this. The character in the book uh, who advises the little girl in my book on manners. Um, we just always called him Mr. Manners, but he doesn't have a name in the book. Um, originally, I sort of drew him like this kind of guy right here. And then I did some variations here, changed the shape of his face right there. Give him a little top hat right here. Um, this is the guy who we wound up using in the book. Um, looks a lot like the Monopoly man, I've been told a billion times. Um, and that's just who the, the uh, people at Scholastic liked and we all said, okay, cool, that's who it is. But, you know, going through this process of designing a character was essential. The little girl didn't change very much from, from the moment I started drawing her. She just kind of stayed the way she was. Uh, but this is this is part of it. You have to also be able to draw these characters at, at you know, usually um, at different angles, right? To keep it consistent, things like that. So if I'm working on something like this ridiculous looking bear, who again, this is just, Really alarming how, how ugly he is, but uh, yeah, let's just make it even worse. It's just going to be so hideous. Um, I would have to try and figure out how to draw him at various angles, you know? So maybe from the front, I say, okay, here's this head shape here. And there's the nose, and then the deep, deep. There we go. Bump, bump. One ear, two ears. Then I think about what he looks like from the side. You know, I don't know. So these kinds of things, you know, character turnarounds, that kind of stuff where you figure them out from different angles, um, figure out how big they are compared to other characters and so on. All this stuff you have to work out 
It's kind of like you're doing a whole a whole television show on your own, you know, with the cast of characters, the environments, and all this. It all goes into picture books. Um, but you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. I have confidence. If you really want to do it, you can do it. So another thing I'll mention here before we go is that you can get involved in things like the SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, they have local chapters in the United States and also abroad. Check that out. Um, there's more you can check out there for information. Um, be sure and check out the free uh, live streams that authors and, and illustrators do all the time when they talk about their books and how they got them made and how they got hooked up with their publisher or their agent. These are always fascinating. Follow Picture Book Folks on Twitter and on Instagram and elsewhere and reach out to them occasionally to answer, ask a question. Don't be you know, overly aggressive or annoying, but certainly a question now and then is, is fair game. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck. I got lucky with my book. It happened. I hope that this was a helpful explanation of how it happened for me and what the process was. And um, I wish everybody, like I said, the best of luck and let's see what happens, okay? Anyway, have a great weekend. Uh, I've got to go back and nurse this cold because um, I just feel like I've had to cough this entire time repressing it. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Remember to be kind. And I will say ciao for now. Thank you.